Welcome to another episode in this Reading Through the Gospel series. This is a 20-week Bible study series, reading through the story of the life of Jesus Christ, particularly in the Gospel of Mark. As you can tell, again, in a different location to film today, circumstantially, but what does it really matter? Today we have chapter 10 in the Gospel of Mark. Last week, chapter 9, we had the transfiguration of Jesus. It's more teaching, it's more healing. Pretty significant chapter. That was last week. See what chapter 10 has to hold for us this week. Start very basically with just a setting. It says that they went from where they were to the district of Judea, across the Jordan. So they're starting to move out of the area of Galilee that they have kind of been in most of this time, downwards, starting to move towards Jerusalem. And they are met there with a crowd and Pharisees and argument and discussion. The first topic we have is marriage and divorce. The Pharisees question Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Referencing something that Moses kind of allowed for back in the Old Testament. They say Moses permitted him to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. Jesus responds to that saying, it was because of the hardness of your hearts he wrote you this commandment. Saying that that was really only a kind of allowance by Moses and by God um, because the people of Moses' time were clearly not following the the commandment to like be loyal to your husband or your wife and like follow through on the sanctity of marriage because that was never really God's intent. Only really an allowance for the time, but the real meaning of marriage, what Jesus says What God has joined together, no human being must separate. Because the way that sometimes marriage is seen as an agreement, kind of, or some kind of partnership, marriage is not just an agreement, but a sacrament. Something where the two are bound together by God. So once you enter the stage of we are married and not just like we're boyfriend and girlfriend where, you know, things can end Like that. Marriage is not the same because you come before God and make vows to each other and are bound by a sacramental union. Now, uh, annulments are a thing in the case of, like, well, we don't, this is not the time or place to talk about all things about marriage. But that's that. And then we move on and we have children coming to Jesus. We have the let the children come to me moment that I think we know fairly well. A few points about that is Jesus tells the the crowd and tells the disciples to accept the kingdom of God like a child. I think that is a really good message for us and something for us to to remember to try to have a childlike faith in terms of obedience, in terms of wonder and awe at Jesus approaching God the Father as us his children, not just childish faith, because there's a difference between childish and childlike attitude, behavior, faith, but to be like a child in respect of God the Father. He also says that the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, to children. An imagery that I really, I really like about heaven is the idea that, like, in heaven, we are all little children, which I think is really cool. Um, the idea of just the innocence of a little kid. Something that I try to do, um, particularly when, if you don't if you don't like someone, if something bothers you, gets on your nerves, someone's kind of annoying, obnoxious, anything like that, something that, that I have tried to do is to think about that person when they were a little kid and to see that person as a little kid. Because when you have like toddlers, Um, you have no idea what they're going to grow up to be. Like, a person who grows up to be uh, a drug dealer or grows up to be, like, a someone who is heavily involved in in substance abuse, heavily involved in, like, sexual misconduct, something like that, they were once a very innocent, lovely toddler. And if we can look at wherever someone is in terms of they, they offend us or they are annoying or they're just in a a bad place in their life wherever on that spectrum if we can see them and remember that they were once an innocent little toddler child 
the same as each one of us, um, we can get to the heart of who they really are as a child in the eyes of God. Then we have the story of the rich young man. He comes up to Jesus and says, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Follow the Ten Commandments. And he says, Teacher, I have done all these things. That is light work for me. And Jesus says, Okay, uh, you have done all these things, but you're lacking one thing. Go and sell all you have. You're a rich young man. You have a lot of wealth. You have a lot of possessions. Give them to those who need them, and then come follow me. And the rich young man is sad, and he goes away. Uh, message for us, maybe, is that how are we in that position? In what way do we approach Jesus and say, I've done all these things. Uh, what more must I do? And he says, there is this one thing, this one thing that you're unwilling to give up, the one thing that, that deep inside you're holding on to, and I need you to give that up. And we say, ah, can't do it. I can't do it. What is that thing for each of us? that we cling to, that we're unwilling to give up, that Jesus is just calling us to, to do so. Maybe fitting because in the season of Lent now, we often fast from something, give something up. Um, maybe there is something that we hold on to like, nope, that's part of my life that I can't, I need it. I can't, I can't give that up, Lord. And then often there's a challenge of fasting during Lent where we we do give up something like that. Maybe it's deeper, maybe it's more surface level, but I think that that maybe holds true for each of us. I apologize if you can hear any of the background noise, the like vents to the side of me. I'm making a lot of loud noises. Anyways, uh, after that, Jesus responds and says, How hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Do we hear that? Do we really think about that? Because I think so often we think that Heaven's just a gimme. That heaven is a guarantee. That heaven's something we've got locked away already. That like we're we got our our guaranteed salvation. That's easy. We're baptized. We're good to go. Jesus says, "How hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? How hard? Easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. It's so hard. The way is is narrow to enter." The kingdom of God. Wow, that is, that is really annoying, and I hope my microphone is not picking that up very much. But how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? That sometimes we think that it's just this, this easy, narrow way. We just kick our feet up. We got this guarantee of heaven. But it's a day after day response of yes to God and a daily pursuit of the kingdom that is difficult and that is the challenge for us um, every day. Jesus also says, uh, There is no one who has given up house or brothers, sisters, etc., who will not receive a hundred times more in the age to come. In terms of those things that we might be holding on to, like, I, I can't give this up, I can't like make myself humbled, I can't make myself poor in the eyes of Christ, we will receive so much more. How much more is there waiting for us that is so hard for us to understand, but to be able to sacrifice with the understanding that God is not outdone in generosity, that he will give us hundreds of times more than what we could already possess. They keep moving down towards Jerusalem. It says that they are on their way to Jerusalem because of that Jesus starts to say like, Now's the time when this is going to happen. He continues to predict his passion that is going to come once they get to Jerusalem. So they're on the way. Um, but on the way, James and John apparently think really highly of themselves. And they say to Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Jesus says, all right, well, what, what do you want? And they say, in your glory that... One of us sits at your right and one of us sits at your left. And we might read that as like in, in heaven. James, James and John want to say like, Lord, in heaven when we get there, me at your right, him at your left. But possibly, probably, they think that Jesus as the Messiah means that he's going to, uh, he's going to 
institute the kingdom on earth and that the Messiah is going to be a ruler on earth and that they're asking to be like at his right and at his left in the earthly kingdom. Because still stuck in this idea that life is about uh, wealth, about personal gain, about lofty status. And Jesus, once again, as we read just a few chapters back, he says that this ministry that we're doing is not about lofty status or personal gain, but it's about service to others. And he, he gives us this great, this great quote. Jesus says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And that is the image that Christ gives to us, that any ministry is not about us, that even, even God himself, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, did not come to be served. The, the highest person of Jesus Christ did not come to be served, but to serve. And finally, we wrap up the chapter. There's a man named Bartimaeus who is blind, and Jesus heals him, and Bartimaeus follows after Jesus. That wraps up the chapter, chapter 10 this week. A lot here. We're on the road to Jerusalem. And we are moving closer and closer to the pinnacle, the climax of the story of Jesus Christ. Hopefully you got something out of this video. Let me know. The thumbs up and a comment down below. Let me know if you've been enjoying this series so far. Got a few more videos to go. We're on our way. That was chapter 10. Hopefully you'll see you next week for Mark chapter 11.